Discover the million dollar sales page secrets used by the world's most successful copywriters and business owners. This is the Copywriting for Sales Pages show. And now your host, sales page expert and copywriting egghead, Debbie Owen. Hey everyone, welcome back. I am super excited to introduce you to my friend, Todd Brown. Um, Todd and I have actually done some work together in the past and it's always a pleasure to have you here with us, Todd. Let me tell you a little bit about Todd, very briefly. He is considered the authority on creating profitable marketing funnels because he's the funnel expert other experts go to when they need help with their own funnels. And his list of clients is like this who, who's who of A-list marketers. And his agency creates campaigns for the biggest direct marketing companies online. And Todd, I'm just really excited to have you here with us today. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm super excited to be here as well. That makes me sound really official and, yes. you know, and serious. Yeah, serious. Well, we know you're not e ever serious. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, listen, let's just dive right in because I like to give people value right up front. So for an online marketing funnel, what's usually the most critical turning point for a prospect? You know, in other words, where in the funnel do you see most prospects move from doubt to trust when they make that decision? OK, I'm ready to buy this thing. I believe the solution can help me solve my problem. Yeah, well, I, I think there's two parts to that answer, really. Okay. First and foremost, I think that the biggest turning point is in the lead, the first 350 to 800 words. I think that, you know, most prospects decide whether they're going to continue to engage with the marketing campaign, whether it's a VSL, whether it's a webinar, whether it's a, a sales letter in those first crucial 350, 500, 600 words and so okay. that's the part of the campaign where our job as marketers is to set the emotional hook to get the prospect emotionally excited about what they're about to hear kind of like mm -hmm. the teaser for the movie the trailer for the movie it's what gets you excited to to stick around and so mm -hmm. that's a big a, a big drop-off point if we look at statistics for example stats of mm -hmm. BSL video sales that are drop off, mm -hmm. you see the biggest drop off in the lead right away. Because what happens is people get kind of, they get interested by the headline and they say, okay, well, let me see what this is about. And then within the lead, we either set that hook or they swim away, so to speak. And so that's yeah. the, that's the first drop off point. Okay. I, I think the other, the other critical area is it's not, let me, I'm trying to think of the easy way to explain this. It's not, there's not one area. What it really comes down to is this, that the marketing campaign is really a, it's really an argument. It's really you putting forth a thesis, this thesis being that your particular product or service can solve the prospect's problem better, faster, cheaper, more effectively than anything else. Mm -hmm. And your entire marketing campaign should be designed to prove that, to show how and why your particular solution does work better. And what happens often is marketers have been trained to focus primarily on benefits, 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 benefits. Right. And they end up presenting this string of claims, one claim after another claim after another claim, simply hoping that because they've said it, that the prospect is going to believe them. Mm -hmm. And they end up presenting a very weak argument that does not lead the prospect to say, huh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I get why this is the answer. They never get there because the argument is weak. And so that's what happens. That's often why, let's say, in a webinar environment, for example, you, the other big drop-off point is when the marketer goes from content and they segue into the offer. And right. then people bail because they're, they're not interested in the offer because the marketer hasn't proven that the solution is the best solution for the prospect. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what are some of the key points a marketer or a, a business owner would need to consider in order to really strongly make that case? How do, how yeah. do they do that? I mean, that's the $64,000 question, right? Yeah, absolutely. So there, there are two things. Number one, before you write a, a single word of copy, before you craft your content, before you craft your marketing message, you have to get clarity on what that 
marketing thesis is, meaning what is that one big overarching belief that your prospects need to have before you go into your offer if they are going to be interested and ready to respond? Mm -hmm. um, and typically that thesis is really some variation of my product and the way my product works can give you the result that you want better, faster, whatever that message is mm -hmm. than anything else out there, right? If the prospect doesn't believe that, that XYZ product or XYZ methodology or XYZ approach is the best solution for them, well, then the likelihood of them responding to the offer really goes down tremendously. So first mm -hmm. and foremost, you, you have to determine up front what is that thesis. Just like if you were going to, if you're, if look, if you're presenting your stance, whether it's on politics or nutrition or faith or whatever it may be, you know ultimately where you're leading your audience, where you want to bring them, uh, what they need to believe, the one overarching belief, kind of like the way a prosecutor operates. A prosecutor, when presenting a case, knows, and right, we, you work, we work right. on messaging for this. Right. Right? Um, you actually did a great job of sharing this, articulating this better than I could. <laughs> but, you know, it's, this, it's the prosecutor presenting a case to a jury, and the one overarching belief that that prosecutor needs the jury to believe is that the defendant is guilty. And everything else that the prosecutor does and says and shows and demonstrates and presents is designed to lead the jury to that conclusion. That's that one thesis. So mm -hmm. first and foremost, it is... What is that one overarching belief? What is that thesis? Mm -hmm. Once you've got that goalpost, that kind of that destination, the, the golf flag in the, in, the, in the hole, so to speak, well, then it's a matter of really going la layers or levels deeper, and meaning asking yourself, well, what do they need then to believe, to believe the thesis? Right. So it's like a chain of beliefs. Exactly. A right. chain of beliefs, which, you know, whether you, if you study folks like Jerry Spence, so, you know, uh, considered or, or supposedly the, the winningest trial attorney ever, uh, and, you know, you study argumentation, debate, what you find is that there's this thesis, this goalpost, and you don't actually, you don't actually get belief in the thesis itself you get belief in in this logic chain this yeah. other these other supporting beliefs that lead to the acceptance of that thesis and so what we end up having to do is and the way you know i structure all marketing campaigns all marketing messages is to support the thesis mm -hmm. one belief at a time we make a claim that we, uh, you know, to, to establish a belief, we make a claim for something they need to believe. We then present proof. We give the benefit of that. And then we go on to the next thing and we right. claim the next thing. And then we present proof and a benefit in the next thing. And that chain, those, what I call CPB chunks, claim, proof, benefit together lead to the acceptance of that thesis. That's great. That's great. And that's a very clear, it's almost, uh, it's almost like a ladder. You know, it's, you can see it. Imagine it's a chain. You can imagine, imagine it's a ladder. You're just climbing up the ladder until you reach that top piece. You know, you've, you've reached it because you've been able to set up all those other beliefs based on the proof that you've given up coming up. Yeah. I, and I, I actually love that kind of that metaphor that that the, the latter even better because you can see that if you were trying to help your prospect climb up that ladder to get to the top and the top is where they accept your thesis and therefore they're ready for the offer. Right. Well, what happens if you miss a rung, if you leave a rung out of the ladder or two, you might get to a point where the gap is just too big for that. Pro like you left out chunks yeah. where the prospect is like, I just can't, I'm not there yet. Yeah. And so when, when you go into the offer, they're, they're gone. The goal is to lead them to a point where before you present your offer, they believe that your solution is the answer. And so when you present your offer, they're grateful for the opportunity to buy because you've educated them and you've led them to that point. Right. So, so this is the, the interesting thing. You know, we all get so wrapped up and involved in what we're writing. It's, I mean, we're so close to it. Yeah. How can you tell if you've left out a couple of rungs? You know, how do you test that out? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And I don't know if I have a great answer for, <laughs> for that question. I think that you really have to constantly ask yourself, is there anything else that they need to believe?
-hmm. they may might not believe in order to believe this. Mm -hmm. So, right, sometimes what marketers do is they, you know, we're, we're often plagued by that whole, the curse of knowledge, right, where mm -hmm. we're so close to our topic that we think everybody is as close as we are. Right. And so sometimes a marketing argument starts uh, with certain assumptions that the prospect already believes these three things and we don't have to address those three things and so we start here right and then we, we go but there's missing things like what do they need to believe to believe this first claim yeah. so to speak and so you just really have to look at it and ask yourself like is there any gap in this is there any any place in this argument that somebody could say yeah but or what mm -hmm. about x or mm -hmm. doesn't LMNOP, you know, like negate that. And so, um, I, you know, this has been, an, it's been an interesting, it's been an interesting journey for me, you know, being in the direct response world for, you know, over 15 years now. When I first got introduced to direct response marketing, I, I was taught this whole idea of salesmanship in print, right? Mm -hmm. It's this idea that what we're doing is really salesmanship in print. And, um, and, you know, so all the copy that I learned to write was typically very sales oriented and sales oriented is more about the product and more about products, features, advantages, benefits, the right. offer, all that, all that. And uh, I've really come to understand over the last, I would say, really six, seven years that it's really not so much salesmanship in print that there really is a tremendous difference between marketing and selling. Mm -hmm. Selling is more akin to advertising. It's more about I've got a product and here's why you should choose this product over your other options out there. But what about all the prospects that are, that are out there that are unsure of what product or type of product or product category they want, or maybe aren't even in the market yet for right. your type of product. And if you start with that kind of sales pitch, you're only tapping into the highest level of awareness segment mm -hmm. or segments of the market. And so it's really been an interesting kind of mm -hmm. uh, awakening for me o over the last, you know, five, six, seven years. Yeah, I was, I was going to talk about market awareness too and how important it is to understand uh, which part of that market you're going for. And yeah. that will help to determine exactly what your marketing language and message is. How aware are they of their problem? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we've got, you know, this was really kind of pioneered by Gene Schwartz, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and you, you know, I'm a huge fan of breakthrough advertising. I think it's the mm -hmm. best book ever published on, on marketing. I think everybody, every entrepreneur and marketer should read it at least once a year. Mm -hmm. And Gene Schwartz talked about these five different levels of, of awareness. And you've got, you know, at the very bottom, you've got unaware. And these are people that aren't even aware that they've got a problem, the problem that your particular product or service can uh, alleviate. Um, and therefore, they have no awareness of the need for a product or service related to that problem. No right. awareness of the problem, no awareness of the need for a solution. And right. then you've got problem aware. These are individuals that are just aware they've, they've got back pain but they don't know yet what are the best solutions or what are their options? Can they use massage, can they, physical therapy, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the solution aware. These are individuals that are kind of, they, they, they're aware that, you know, there's chiropractic and there's massage therapy and, and they're kind of now, which one do I, you know, uh, which one am I going for? Am I going for massage? Or am I going for chiropractic? And then you've got the product aware. These are individuals that, let's say, they've decided they want a chiropractor, and now what they're trying to decide on is who's the best chiropractor, mm -hmm. right? So, and then at the very top, we've got most aware, and these are typically your customers. They're aware of you, your product, your service, what you're all about, your positioning, and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Well, every market is made up of all of those levels of awareness, and it, so it's not a matter of determining which one of those levels is your market, it's determining which one of those segments of awareness you're going to target right. with, your, with your marketing. Because like you said uh, so eloquently that it changes the language that you have to use because, right, we could talk to the solution aware individual, the person who's now, they, they've decided they want a chiropractor and now they're looking for the best one. We might have a marketing message that is, 
why Bob Smith, Dr. Bob Smith is the best chiropractor in West Palm Beach and blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. that wouldn't be effective for the unaware segment who's got no awareness of a need for a chiropractor or they're not in the market for a chiropractor. And so, right. um, so it's, a, it's a big part of really understanding understand who your audience is so that you can speak the language that's most appropriate for them. Yeah, and that, I think that's a, a common mistake that, that marketers make is not fully understanding that th those different elements of the market and who they want to target and why. Because there are different reasons for targeting one or the other. I sure. mean, some are, some are harder to convince and others are easier to convince, but, you know, they're, <laughs> they're in just yeah. different places. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the, the, the interesting thing, you know, that's the kind of, you know, in, in like in most things in life, there's a, there's a give and take, you know, and so the higher up on that awareness pyramid you go, and I, I lay it out as a pyramid to illustrate the, 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 the size of the universe at each of those levels, the higher right. up you go, the easier it is, because the more aware they are, the more, right. And, and so, but the smaller the universe is, meaning mm -hmm. that, Right, it's it's easier, so you can have typically a shorter campaign. It's not as complex. You could be more direct in your languaging, in your in your mm -hmm. um, in your offer, um, and it's it's easier. But the universe shrinks, and it yeah. shrinks exponentially as you go up. As you go down the pyramid, the universe exponentially gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but it becomes more difficult. Uh, it is typically requires a longer uh, or a more complex campaign, and it typically requires a more difficult campaign to construct, which is an indirect lead, right? Mm -hmm. when, you're go when you're going to somebody who doesn't have any awareness of their problem or any awareness of the need for a solution, you obviously can't be as direct in your pitch. You can't start off talking about why I'm the best chiropractor in, in West Palm Beach. You have to be much more indirect about it. And that indirect approach is a lot more difficult to pull off. But when you do, when you do, you end up like a company like Agora, mm -hmm. which is, you know, over now, you know, a billion and a quarter a year, you know, <laughs> in the direct response world, because they've really mastered that art uh, and, and, and science of appealing to the unaware segment with their messages. Right. And actually, that's great, because it brings us back full circle to the first question I asked, which is, you know, where, where, do pe where do people lose trust? Or how do you gain the trust when you're, you know, and so that that yeah. kind of helps describe all of that. That's great. Yeah. I'm going to take a slightly different tack um, at this point, because in addition to creating funnels for your clients and teaching others how to create funnels that work, you're also really well known for helping people understand the concept of the big idea. Yeah. Can you explain exactly what that, that, what that is and where it shows up in the marketing funnel and where, where it's part of your message? Yeah, so let me first give credit where credit's due. I, I really learned this from my friend and mentor, Mark Ford. Mm -hmm. uh, folks might know him under his pen name, Michael Masterson, a brilliant, brilliant guy. And so, you know, Mark once said to me, I, when I asked Mark, you know, what's been responsible for Agora's, you know, growth, the Agora companies, how have they grown so big and, and so fast? I, you know, I thought he was going to say a number of different things. Their, you know, their email list size or the amount of money that they spend or, you know, all mm -hmm. these different things. And he didn't say any of any of those things. What he said is that we realized early on that we're really in the idea business. Mm -hmm. We're in the business of developing a, and disseminating interesting, compelling, uh, novel, unique, different ideas to the marketplace. And that led me on this six year journey, really exploring and studying and, and, and uh, dare I say, mastering the big idea, which is probably a monster stretch. Um, <laughs> and the big idea is a way to get attention in a marketplace without trying to scream a louder promise or use uh, hype or hyperbole or exaggeration. And a, a big marketing idea is an idea that appeals to both the heart and the head. It's both emotionally compelling and intellectually interesting. Mm -hmm. And a big marketing idea is, again, like I said, it's a new idea. It's, it's a unique idea. It's a different idea. You're bringing an, an idea, an, an angle, a story, a perspective to the marketplace that they haven't heard before. 
right? That they haven't been presented with um, before. And it's, it's, again, it's unique and, and different. It is typically fresh and timely, meaning it feels like it, it, it applies to today. Typically, it applies to something that's either going on today or is about to uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, go on. It typically makes one promise. So there's one overarching primary, uh, primary promise. There's typically some sort of a reference or allusion to a new mechanism, a new way of getting the result, the promise, the outcome. Um, and there's a component that makes it feel newsworthy, meaning it gives the prospect the feeling of discovery and an aha moment. Like they just stumbled on something that they, makes them say, well, why haven't I heard about this before? Why, right. why doesn't anybody else know about this? And so because of that, it, it's a way of, of getting attention and, and standing out without having to use uh, hype and exaggeration. I, I love that description where you, you, that aha moment of, why haven't I heard of this before? Yeah. Why isn't anybody else talking about it? I think that might be kind of the, the acid test, you know, for, to, to determine, is this really a big idea? Because yeah. the other thing that people really struggle with is what's the difference between a big idea and a unique mechanism. Could you talk about that just for a moment? Yeah, so the unique mechanism is actually very simple. It's this, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a fancy name for a, really a simple concept. And it's the unique mechanism is how does your product deliver the result? Right? What is unique about the way your product or service delivers, fulfills on the promise that you're making? Mm -hmm. So is it the algorithm in your software that gets people Google rankings? Is it the recipe behind your birthday cakes that make them so moist and, and delicious? Is it the unique combination of nutrients in your supplement that brings down cholesterol so quickly and so efficiently? Is it the unique combination of body work methods that you use that helps to alleviate somebody's um, low back pain? It answers the question of how and why does your product deliver um, the, the results so effectively and, and, and so efficiently. And of course, what we're looking for is unique mechanism. Oftentimes in, in every product and service, there is a mechanism in every product and service, whether mm -hmm. it's if you're a consultant, there's a framework that you use, a methodology that you use, there's a set of questions that you use. Every software is built with some kind of algorithm, whether it's well thought out or not, or mm -hmm. right? And so every product or service has a mechanism. What we're looking for is that unique mechanism. And oftentimes the, the truth is that more often than not, a unique mechanism is a marketing invention. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that there are three different, really, there are three different ways to come up with a unique mechanism. One is you actually have one. There is an algorithm. There is a, a unique recipe uh, in your pasta sauce or whatever. Um, and then the, the, the second one is really what I would call the unspoken mechanism. And that's, you know, it goes back to the, to the um, story of, of, uh, of Claude Hopkins being brought into the Schlitz beer factory, oh. right? And, Taking, being taken on a tour and he said what's going on over there and they said oh that's where we sterilize all the bottles before we put the beer in there and he said well why aren't you telling anybody about that and and the, the gentleman said to him well because every beer manufacturer sterilizes their their bottles and, and Claude Hopkins said but nobody's talking about it right so Claude ended up taking that it became their unique mechanism behind why Schlitz beer was so fresh and tasty and mm -hmm. and right it was the unspoken mechanism it was unique to prospects, not necessarily unique amongst competitors. And mm -hmm. so it served as a way in the prospect's mind of differentiating um, why Schlitz beer was better. And at the time, it allowed Claude Hopkins to help, you know, really massively increase their market share. Mm -hmm. And then the third way is, I, I call it, you know, the, the transubstantiated mechanism. And it's just this fancy word. And that really comes from Bill Bonner, the the. Okay. the the founder of Agora, you know, transubstantiation comes from the world of Roman Catholicism. Right. They turn the blood of Christ, uh, excuse me, the, the wine into the blood of Christ. Right. And it really just means turning the ordinary into the extraordinary. 
Mm -hmm. And so it is looking at, let's say, the cholesterol supplement and looking at the, the formulation, for example, and asking the product creator, why did you include this in here? And why did you include this in here? And why did you include this dosage? And why did you include this type? And looking at, is there a method behind that formulation? Because if there is a method that that product creator used to put that together, well, then name it. Name the formulation. Give it a name. There's nothing that's stopping you from giving a name to your combination of nutrients, your combination of steps in your approach to writing copy or optimizing a sales page or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And so lots of unique mechanisms get created that way. And so typically, the big idea introduces the unique mechanism along with that intellectually interesting component. So it's kind of a way, a way to think about it is like this, to really simplify the big idea. A big idea is a way to promise make it present a big, bold, audacious promise of change, right? The, the sexiest thing, so to speak, that mm -hmm. the prospect that we could actually deliver to the prospect by or through a unique mechanism, a new way, a way that the prospect has never been given before or offered before, which gives mm -hmm. the prospect hope and excitement that maybe this time around they will experience that outcome, that result, uh, um, coupled with an intellectually interesting component. Intellectually interesting, promise, unique mechanism, boom. boom. You've got a very compelling <laughs> idea. There you go. There's the recipe, right? <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Todd, is there like a um, is there a favorite sales page story of success that you can share with us? You know, some maybe it was something that completely helped turn the page around or that came out of the gate gate going gangbusters. Is is there some great sales story? big aha that you can share from that? Um, wow, that's, a, that's great. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think the story that I would share that's probably freshest on my mind mm -hmm. is when we, we actually partnered with um, my good friend, Joe Schriefer, who is the head honcho over at Agora Financial, which is a division of, of Agora, the fastest mm -hmm. growing division uh, of Agora. <laughs> Um, and we partnered to bring their copywriting methodology to the marketplace, what they call the Agora Financial Copy School. Mm -hmm. They, whenever they hire new copywriters, they put them through an eight week training process twice a week and very extensive, very deep process. And when Joe came to me and he asked me if I would bring it to the marketplace, I was ecstatic. And sure. there's a lesson here for this. I was ecstatic and thrilled, one, because I was ec ecstatic that I could do a favor for my friend and help him, uh, and so I always loved that. Mm -hmm. I was also ecstatic because I knew that there was pent-up demand in the marketplace. I knew the marketplace was going to go wild. Folks oh, wild. on my team, you know, yeah. Damien, folks on my team, they, did, they were like, ah, and I'm like, trust me, <laughs> this is a big one. Relax, this is me, like yeah. I'm telling you. And so there's a lesson there, right? That when you, when you can pay attention to your market and when you look for gaps and pent up demand, your results, if you seize that opportunity, can be infinitely greater and much easier to, yeah. to, to generate. So the real, the, the thing that I, 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 I loved about that campaign was that I really decided to kind of buck the trend and go in a very different direction with how I delivered mm -hmm. that, that campaign. And mm -hmm. what I decided to do was I decided to get on a plane and go to Baltimore and spend the day there. And really with this premise that I was going to present the story to the marketplace of me going to Baltimore to find out about their copywriting methodology, right? Mm -hmm. I, I really had already known their copywriting methodology, but I wanted to get pictures and I wanted to do interviews and I wanted to get stuff that I knew I was going to use as part of the campaign to leak out. Yeah. Well, so once I, once I, 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 I did that, I then decided that I wanted to show up differently with this campaign, meaning I not only wanted the message to be different, which is always what we're looking for, but I wanted it to look different and feel yeah. different. And so I decided that I was going to use kind of a series of essays that told the story of my day in um in baltimore and so it was a series of seven essays that it started out in the morning and then it was the mid-morning and the afternoon and 
and it was a lot of dialogue, a lot of, you know, behind the scenes pictures and the, and so no VSL, no webinar, no nothing like that. No mention of the product, like the, the, the product that we were going to offer at any point in those mm -hmm. seven essays. It was just sharing and giving. And it was sharing and giving through this narrative loaded with dialogue, loaded mm -hmm. with dialogue, which allowed me to communicate certain things through Joe and all the other characters oh. that, I, that I got to meet with. And then we opened up the sales letter we had 300 copies and this was all engineered and orchestrated i said to joe i think 350 copies me i said to joe we're going to do 150 copies i want them hand numbered each thumb drive we put it on a thumb drive they were hand numbered um we registered the domain name something like just 350 or only 350.com or something like that and um in the morning that the that that sales letter went live um, it was something like I've never personally seen before. It was our, you know, our CRM Infusionsoft wasn't, couldn't update fast enough to, so something in the first, it, it was like under 60 seconds. It was, you know, something like 70,000 had already come the first like 60 seconds or some crazy oh number. Um, and this and, was this was after seven days of e of value value laden emails. Yeah, the, of, of it was actually we we put I posted the essays on a web page, so right. it was like right, and then every day I, I would post this, the second one, and then we would send folks to the second one, and there were there were links, and yeah. at the end of the second one, it was you know part three coming tomorrow, and then the next part. And the beautiful thing was the funny thing was I really enjoyed doing that campaign. I actually wrote the pieces the morning of when they were pub, they were published oh, wow. at like noon and I wrote them in the morning and it was just fun and cool. And it shows you that, that you don't have to hard sell. I didn't mention the product in any of that. I didn't say so, anything. Day seven, I think, right? I, I think maybe, um, uh, no, actually not even on the, not even in that, um, in that final essay, it was, we sent an email afterwards okay. that was something like, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to release the product you know, we're going to release it on Monday. You guys will have the opportunity. And there was just, it was, it was the perfect storm because yeah. pent up demand, right? There was tremendous urgency and scarcity. There was tremendous social proof. It was a very compelling story. It was, it was a product that nobody else had ever had the opportunity to get before and they knew that there would there wouldn't be an opportunity you know going forward and so it was just the perfect storm and it was an unbelievable day that i will never <laughs> never forget and it, it just it's taught me a lot of things it, it it's it's taught me and reminded me of a lot of things one that look for opportunities to leverage that pent-up demand Right. So if I took another product and an ordinary product off the shelf and I use that same format, uh, uh, there's no way that I would have gotten that we would have seen the same results that we did. So a right. big part of it was just this pent up demand. The other thing is that we engineered a lot of elements into the campaign. We engineered the urgency. We engineered the scarcity. We we did that intentionally. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and it was real. Once it was yeah. done, it was done. Um right. Uh, and so, yeah, and the, the, the final lesson, which I mentioned already, was just, you know, that uh, showing up differently, right? And that, yeah. you know, there's too much in, inside of the online marketing world. It's so incestuous. Mm -hmm. And it's so, you know, let me copy this one. And, let me, and what happens is somebody shows up to your page and it looks like every other webinar page that they've show, shown up to you trigger that mental opt out. I know what's coming. I know what's about to happen. Right. And, 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 you know, in, in a lot of cases they're out. And so this was just completely different from, uh, from what we had done before. Yeah. yeah. And particularly because your market is marketers who do this kind of thing all the time. Now somebody who is, you know, doing supplements, maybe, maybe their market won't be as jaded, but, Correct. um, uh, but for your market, it had to be something different and people are still talking about it. It was a brilliant campaign. And uh, I followed it closely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It was, you know, it's an interesting thing too, you know, and I think you're absolutely right. You know, there's so many, you know, the, 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 I'm a marketer marketing to marketers. Right. And so that puts everything that we do under the microscope. Absolutely. And so I don't wish that on anybody. 
There are, you know, I don't, I have many, many conversations where, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, when there are lots of people that come in and start learning internet marketing and they think I want to be this guru and I want to, right. I want to market to marketers and, and, and it's, it's, it's so I'm envious of the people that, that are, that get to do marketing where they're marketing, not critiqued and, 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 and judged and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so you're absolutely right. There's a lot of stuff that we don't do simply because of positioning mm -hmm. or because, you know, the market has seen it, but outside of these circles, uh, it would be, it would work like gangbusters. Yeah. Like it'd be a lot easier to teach marketing to lawyers, for instance, or something sure. like that, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and so, yeah, or yeah. even, you know, like Damien comes from the world of uh, real estate investing and he worked mm -hmm. for a, a large real estate investing company that taught other people how to do real, real estate investing. Right. And, you know, they weren't judged by the quality of their marketing per se, because they're not viewed as marketers. They're viewed as real estate investing experts. And so right. they can get away with certain things, not, not having, you know, not, not crossing every T and dotting every I from a marketing perspective. Um, and, you know, which is just an exciting, should be an exciting thing for all your listeners and everybody that yeah. op operates in all those different. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, I, I like to end these conversations with one last question. And, and that is, what do you know now? that you wish you had known when you started? Is there anything that you would do differently? Yeah, there absolutely is. Uh, and I've talked about this many times. Um, knowing what I know today, I would have invested more money in acquiring new customers. Mm -hmm. In other words, I, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, as, as entrepreneurs, we, we, we look at business and growing a business uh, through the lens of, of profit, mar you know, margin. And so we're taught uh, that every sale that you make, you want to have a margin in there. If you sell something for $100, you want you know, $50 of, of profit. You want a 50% margin or whatever it may be. And that's the way the typical mom and pop entrepreneur operates. And that's the, the way that I operated, right? Back, mm -hmm. way back. I would spend, you know, if I was going to sell something for a hundred bucks to a single customer, I was only willing to spend $50 to get mm -hmm. that customer because I knew that at $50, I'm selling something for a hundred. I'm going to profit uh, at, mm -hmm. you know, that, that my margin. Uh, but I, I came to really learn that that's not the way the biggest, fastest growing direct response companies operate. And today at a bare minimum, I, I tell all of our new students and clients that are minimum, you should be operating at break even on mm -hmm. the front. Mm -hmm. Meaning, so if you're going to generate a hundred dollar sale, you should be willing to spend a hundred dollars to get that right. customer. Because what that means is that you are growing a database of customers and leads for free. Mm -hmm. So like if you invest, if you invest a thousand and you get back a thousand, um, in new customers plus leads that you didn't that you didn't convert. Your bank account is no less today than it was two days ago or three days ago or four days ago. The difference is that you've acquired a very valuable asset, the most valuable asset in your business, which right. is a a customer. And so, mm -hmm. knowing what I know today, I would have invested a lot more to acquire a customer. I would have been a lot more aggressive. Uh, mm -hmm. with what it is that I, I would have looked at it as an investment and not an expense. Right. It's not an expense like the telephone, the electric, the cable, the modem, you know, your, your internet connection. Um, it's an investment because your customers are hopefully if you take care of them are going to be worth, worth more in the future. And so that's what I would have done. Definitely. Yeah, that's, that's huge. And I think a lot of people are still, even though you want to be able to say, Oh, I, you know, I'll spend a hundred to get a hundred. It's still that, it's hard to do that because yeah. you feel like, oh, I need to be making a little bit of money off of this, but you don't. You don't. You don't. And the big awesome back end piece that that's where you get your money from. The biggest, and this is what folks, you know, new folks don't understand. And 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 again, I I you know I can talk passionately about this because I didn't understand this at all. Mm -hmm. It because it's it 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 goes against common sense or what you would think is common sense. The biggest direct response companies, the biggest, fastest growing direct response companies, they don't even break even on the front. They go negative. And so what that means is that if they might spend $120 to get a new customer that today spends 100 
So they're willing to go out of pocket every time they get a customer by $20, let's just say. Well, why? Because they know that that asset, that new customer is going to spend more and more with them over the coming, all driven by metrics. It's all mm -hmm. based on, right, numbers, metrics, mm -hmm. data. So we're not guessing, we're not wondering. Some customers are going to spend another 1000 Some are going to spend 3000 Some are going to spend nothing more, right? But averaging it, averaging it out, you might see, well, the, every new customer I get spends another 500 on average over the next five months. Well, so then the question really becomes, would you be willing, if you had the money, assuming you had the cash flow, would you be willing to spend 20 bucks today to get a customer that spends 500 with you over the coming five months? Or oh, it, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like saying, would you invest in a stock if you knew for sure? Would you invest 20 bucks in a stock today that you knew would pay you out 500 guaranteed over the, over the coming five months? You know, when you, when you start to look at it through the lens of an investor, mm -hmm. then you start to see the, um, you know, you start to see the wisdom. The issue is that it, you have to have two things in order to do that. One, you have to have rock solid metrics. You have to have numbers. You have to know, right? And we are in the numbers business. We're in the psychology, communication, and arithmetic business. And mm -hmm. the arithmetic are, are, are those numbers. And of course, you have to have the cash flow. So a company like, let's say, Agora, they can afford to, like, uh, uh, let's say Agora Financial, it takes them six months to get to break even. Meaning, so they acquire a customer today. They don't recoup 100% of their ad spend for six months. A long so, runway. Long time. So now you can start to do the math. If you were going negative by $20 and you acquired, let's say, 10,000 customers, my gosh, now you're at $200,000 that you, you have to vote out of your pocket. Mm -hmm. Not the easiest thing to do. It's not, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's certainly not. It takes a, a different mindset. Believe yeah. <laughs> I can tell you that it takes a, a vastly different mindset. Yeah. And, so, and you have to be careful because you can get too aggressive, right? So in other words, you can have a business that is thriving in terms of customer acquisition and you could go out of business because imagine if you were doing, let's say what Agora was doing, imagine you were spending tw going out of pocket by $20 every time you got a new customer and you didn't recoup that, that 20 for six months well you could run out of money in month three right if you're not you know if you're not careful so it's why i recommend everybody listening to this everybody starts out at break even because you can't go wrong you know break even you you will acquire new customers grow your list for free right and start with that minimum viable funnel making sure that it works before you start to expand yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, you're a pro. You're, you're, <laughs> I could have been interviewing you. All oh, I tell you, I have Todd Brown in my head every time I talk to people. So, Well, you know, the, the, the interesting thing, and I, I, I've said this before and I'll say it again, I've never out, you are the only person that I've ever allowed to communicate and articulate my ideas to the, um, to the marketplace. And, uh, and you did a tremendous job with it. And so we're in this together with this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> totally. It's been awesome. It's been awesome. Well, this has been an incredible interview. Thank you so much for being here, Todd. As always, you're the best out there. Everybody pay attention to this man and you won't go wrong. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Debbie. Okay. Hi, I'm Deborah Owen from Big League Copywriting. Knowing how to write copy for your business is one of the most important skills you can learn. I see many business owners who make mistakes in their copy that are really easy to fix. Now find out if you're making any of those mistakes by picking up your copy of Why Your Sales Page Isn't Converting, 12 Big Mistakes Business Owners Make When Writing Your Own Copy. You can find it at bit.ly slash why sales page isn't converting. Let's get you some sales page success.